It's good to have you join me on the news. The headline says India's opposition targets Modi in their no-confidence motion. Ukraine to receive dozens of second-hand Leopard 1 tanks. Irish police mistakenly share officers' vital information. Moscow intercepts two armed drones and eight Amazon countries launch summit in Brazil. India's opposition accused Prime Minister Narendra Modi of choosing silence while a northeastern state ruled by his party shook in ethnic violence as parliament started debate on Tuesday on a no-confidence motion against his government that's sure to be defeated. Congress party lawmaker Gaurav Kogai said, if Bandapur is burning, India is burning. If it's divided, India is divided as open debate on the motion. Modi has been largely silent on the bloodshed in the remote state for three months, which teeters on the edge of a civil war, and the opposition motivated the no-confidence motion to force Modi to tackle the Manipur conflict from the floor of parliament. He is anticipated to speak on Thursday when the motion will be put to a vote. Modi's Bharatiya Janata Party rule government holds a clear majority in parliament, meaning the motion is certain to be defeated. Kogoi said the no-confidence motion was never about numbers but about seeking justice for Manipur. He said Modi's silence showed the failure of his party on a state and federal level and said Modi has not uttered a word of condolence or even appeal for peace in Manipur since the violence erupted in early May. Rahul Gandhi, top position leader, is also anticipated to speak on Tuesday, a day after his parliamentary seat was restored. A fair critic of Modi and his major challenger in the 2024 polls, Gandhi was disqualified from parliament in March after a court convicted him for defamation over mocking the prime minister's surname. On Monday, he was reinstated as a member of parliament after India's Supreme Court temporarily stopped his conviction last week. The step is likely to reinforce a struggling opposition and their new alliance, which will take on Modi's BJP in next year's general election. India's parliament has been blocked in a strong impasse for weeks over the catastrophe in Manipur. Sessions closely, closely every day have been adjourned over protesters and sloganeering from the opposition. They have also called for the dismissal of Biran Sain, Manipur's top elected official and a BJP member, and to enforce a rule that will bring the state under direct federal control. Over 150 deaths have occurred in Manipur and more than 50,000 people have fled in fear as clashes continue to break out. The fight was stoked by an assenting action controversy in which Christian cookies protested a demand by mostly Hindu Métis for a special status that will lead that will let them rather than buy land in the hills populated by cookies and other tribal groups and get a share of government jobs. Critics say the government has shared very little publicly on the situation in Manipur and their plans to resolve it. Home Minister Amit Shah visited the state in May and held meetings with community leaders and groups, but the violence has persisted despite these attempts and heavy army protests. Now talking Russia-Ukraine war, according to the arms trader who conducted the deal, loads of second-hand Leopard 1 tanks that once belonged to Belgium have been bought by another European country for Ukrainian forces fighting Russia's invasion. The German-made Leopards were at the center of a public spat earlier this year after Belgian Defense Minister Ludwig de Donda said the government had explored buying back obsolete tanks to send to Ukraine, but had been quoted on reasonable prices. The clash emphasized the difficulty faced by Western governments trying to find weapons for Ukraine. After over a year of extreme warfare, arms they discarded as obsolete and now in high demand and often owned by private companies. On Tuesday, Freddie Versley, CEO of the defense company OIP Land Systems, said he bought the old tanks from the Belgian government more than five years ago. He said, according to reports, that he had now sold all 50 tanks to another European government, which he could not name due to a confidentiality clause, adding that he also could not reveal the price he was paid for the Leopards. Dozens of Kiev's Western allies agreed earlier this year to send more than Leopard 2 tanks to Ukraine, as well as all the Leopard 1 models. On Tuesday evening, reports said arms maker in Mental had acquired the Leopard 1 tanks and would prepare most of them for export to Ukraine. The company declined to comment. He said the tanks were now being transported to a factory for a substantial overhaul. Some of the tanks will be used for spare parts, while others will be repaired, he said, estimating it could be four to six months before they are on the battlefield in Ukraine. 
Handelsblatt said the 50 tanks will be refurbished at Rhein Metal factories in Germany and the 30 overhauled models will be made ready for export. It did not name any government as being behind the deal. The German Defense Ministry had no instant comment as well. The Leopard 1 was made by the German firm Cross Mayfi beginning in the 1960s. It is lighter than the Leopard 2 and has a different type of major gun. The models sold by Versilus were last upgraded in the 1990s. Now, Northern Ireland's police force unintentionally shared the names and work locations of every member of staff in a data breach it said will be of significant concern to officers who have been aimed by armed groups. The police service of Northern Ireland sent the surnames, initials, work location and department of each staff member were included in the error on Tuesday in response to a freedom of information request. The information was publicly available on the requester's website for about two and a half hours before being removed. There is nothing at the moment to suggest any immediate concerns to individual security, Assistant Chief Constable Chris Todd said, according to report. It is remitted to Sony Manisha only, but that will still be of significant concern for many of my colleagues. I know that, and we will ensure we will do everything we can to mitigate any security risks that are identified, Todd said. Officers' data is especially sensitive in Northern Ireland as many go to great lengths and do everything possible to safeguard their police identity and role. The Police Federation for Northern Ireland, the representative body for officers, said in a statement. The United Kingdom's MI5 intelligence agency added that the threat level in Northern Ireland from domestic terrorism to severe meaning an attack is highly likely after an off-duty officer was left seriously wounded in February following a gun attack by the new IRA, one of the small armed groups opposed to peace. Police Federation Chair Liam Kelly called for an urgent inquiry into the leak, report said. While a 1998 peace deal largely ended three decades of violence in Northern Ireland, police officers are still sporadically aimed of armed groups in bomb and gun raids. More on Russia. Ukraine war says Russian air defenses have shot down two armed drones headed for Moscow. The city's mayor said the U.S. in a surge of drone attacks on the Russia's capital city. Early on Wednesday, Moscow Mayor Sergei Subanin said that one drone was downed in Domodedovo area of the southern outskirts of the city, while the second was shot down in the Minsk Highway area west of the capital. According to reports from Russia, the attempted drone attack on Wednesday citing the country's defense ministry as saying that Ukrainian drones were destroyed in an attempt to attack Moscow. The drone raid was a, at least the third trial attack on Moscow within a week. Ukrainian drones were downed on Sunday in the Poloski district of the capital's outskirts and on Monday close to the Kuloga region, according to Russian officials. Russia's defense ministry said last week that it had shot down seven drones also near Kaluga, which is fewer than 200 kilometers, 124 miles southwest of Moscow. Moscow has lately become an attack aim of drones launched from Ukraine. On July 30th, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky warned that war was coming to Russia with the country's symbolic centers and military bases becoming targets. On environment, eight South American countries have agreed to launch an alliance to protect the Amazon, pledging at a summit in Brazil to stop the world's biggest rainforest from reaching a point of no return. Leaders from South American nations also challenged developed countries to do more to stop the enormous destruction of the world's largest rainforest. Attacks, they said, cannot fall to just a few countries when the crunch has been caused by so many. The closely watched summit of the Amazon Cooperation Treaty Organization, ACTO, adopted on Tuesday what host country Brazil called a new and ambitious shared agenda to save the rainforest a vital buffer against climate change that experts caution is being pushed to the brink of collapse. The group's members, Bolivia, Brazil, Colombia, Ecuador, Guyana, Peru, Suriname and Venezuela, signed a joint declaration in Belém at the mouth of the Amazon River, laying out a closely 10,000-word roadmap to promote sustainable development and deforestation and fight the organized crime that fuels it. 
for the summit, attendees stopped short of agreeing to the key demands of ev environmentalists and indigenous groups, including for all member countries to adopt Brazil's pledge to end illegal deforestation by 2030 and Colombia's promise to halt new oil exploration. Instead, countries will be left to pursue their individual deforestation goals. Brazilian President Luiz Inácio Lula de Silva, who has staked his international reputation on improving Brazil's environmental standing, had been pushing for the region to unite behind a common policy of ending deforestation by 2030. The two-day summit opened on the same day. The European Union's Climate Observatory confirmed that July was the hottest month ever recorded on Earth. Lula emphasized the severe worsening of the climate crisis in his opening speech. The challenges of our era and the opportunities arising from them demand we act in unison, he said. It has never been so urgent, he added. Gustavo Petro, Colombian president, urged a radical rethink of the global economy, calling for a Marshall Plan-style strategy in which developing countries' debt is cancelled in exchange for action to protect the climate. The failure of the eight Amazon countries to agree on a binding pact to protect their forests were greeted with disappointment by some. Marcio Astrini of the environmental lobby group Climate Observatory said the plan planet is melting. We are breaking temperature records every day. It is not possible that a scenario like this eight Amazonian countries are unable to put in a statement in large letters that deforestation needs to be zero. And here are more stories. Nigerian local businesses feel the sting of sanctions on Niger. A decision by a bloc of West African nations to shut down their borders with Niger as a way of sanctioning its coup plotters is hurting local businesses in northern Nigeria, where a cross-border economy has bellowed for years. The bloc, known as ECOWAS, limited financial transactions and shut the borders between Niger and its member nations as part of steps to force the coup plotters to reinstate Nigerian president Mohamed Bazoum, who was overthrown last month by soldiers in his presidential guard. For the stink of the sanctions against the Juta is being felt on the other side of the 1,600 kilometers, 995 miles long border in Nigeria. According to a study by the Central Bank of Nigeria, Niger accounts for 75% of the total value of exports from Nigeria's cross-border informal trade. The bank's newest report in 2016 valued goods trader across the border with Niger at 828 billion naira, that's 934 million US dollars a year. In Nigeria's northwestern Katsina states, the border's closure and restricted traffic on nearby roads left several trucks stranded for days, most of them loaded with food items and other perishable goods. Prices of livestock, animal products, and some commodities usually supplied from the city of Maradi in Niger have added, local residents said. Nigeria's authorities are imposing the restriction of movement across the border, but the measure has also affected traffic in the surrounding area, including truck drivers not heading to Niger, but other border towns in Nigeria. Stranded trucks with goods are seen at the border between Nigeria and Niger in Gibia, Nigeria, Monday, August 7, 2023. The sanctions by the West African group ECOWAS, with a history of their own coups, have failed to force the coup plotters next door to reinstate Basum. Since the July 26th school, the Munitius soldiers have installed General Abdurrahman Chachani as head of state and have also threatened to retaliate against any military intervention by ECOWAS member states. The junta has also overruled the proposed visit by representatives of ECOWAS, the African Union and the United Nations. Four coups in West Africa since 2020 do not bode well for the present ECOWAS chairman and Nigeria's president President Bola Tinibu, at least as far as the bloc's next steps are concerned. Tinibu is seeking to make a good impression on the international scene, said Oluwole Ajewali of the African Focus Institute of Security Studies. Niger's coup is the first test of Tinibu's leadership, he said. Now, at least three dead in minibus strike in Cape Town. Police said Monday, Cape Town's public transport system has been paralyzed by a minibus taxi strike that in a violent turn has seen three people killed. Drivers of minibus taxis, the major mode of transport for millions of working class South Africans, blocked several roads in a strike that commenced last Thursday as a result of clashes with city authorities. 
the South African National Taxi Council, Santaco, called for the action over a new municipal bylaw that gives the city the power to impound vehicles over offences such as driving without a licence, not displaying registration plates or overloading. Tensions boiled over after 15 mini buses were impounded on Tuesday and Thursday. Numerous of stranded commuters piled up at bus and taxi stations across the city, with hundreds opting to walk home late into the night while others slept at the stations as incidents of violence broke out. On Friday night, a police officer was shot and killed in a vehicle in a township 20 kilometers southeast of Cape Town while on patrol. Police said they could not rule out the killing was connected to the strike as it came while officers were performing crime prevention patrols to quell taxi-related incidents. Police in an update on Monday said another person was shot dead and three others wounded after a motorist was pelted with stones on the road leading to the city's airport. Authorities later added that a third body, that of a 28-year-old man who sustained multiple gunshot wounds in an attack believed to be taxi-related, was found nearby. The airport road was eventually cleared in the afternoon. Its blockade had urged the British High Commission to advise travellers to avoid driving to the airport, fearing some might run into trouble. Santaco, who claimed that 6,000 vehicles have been impounded since the beginning of the year, said they have been left with no other option due to the frivolous impoundment operations run by the government. Numerous public buses and city vehicles have been set alight, city and transport authorities said. Private cars have also been stoned, touched or shot at and some medical clinics have been forced to close or operate at reduced capacity. Some shops have been looted with protesters making away with household appliances, clothing and liquor. Police said adding five people were arrested for possession of suspected stolen property. After failed negotiations at the weekend between Santaco and the government, it announced the action will continue until Wednesday. Let's take a quick break. When we come back, I'll bring you more stories. Stay with us. You're welcome back. Thank you for staying with us. Now, stories from Nigeria says ECOWAS plans fresh sanctions on Niger. The economic community of West African states has enforced heavier financial sanctions on the Niger junta and entities supporting them, including the governments of Mali and Burkina Faso. The development came after a diplomatic mission by the African Union, ECOWAS, United Nations and the United States to resolve the political impasse in Niger hit a brick wall on Tuesday as the military junta refused to grant audience to the delegations. The military leaders also disregarded the acting U.S. Deputy Secretary of State, Victoria Nuland, and denied her access to the coup leader, General Abdurrahman Chani, and ousted President Mohamed Bazoum, who was being held in the presidential palace. On July 26, some military officers led by Chani overthrew Bazoum, leading to a burst of sanctions imposed on Niger by ECOWAS to compel them to restore the ousted president to power. Presidential spokesman Ajuri Ngalele on Tuesday said in Abuja that more sanctions had been imposed on the individuals and entities connected with the military junta. The joint AU, ECOWAS and UN delegation planned a trip to Niemi to negotiate with the junta ahead of the Thursday summit of ECOWAS, but the military officers denied permission to enter Niger to the delegation according to a letter circulated on social media whose authenticity was confirmed by a Niger army spokesman. Announcing the latest round of sanctions in Abuja on Tuesday, Ngalele said that the newest prohibition was aimed at individuals and entities relating with the military junta in Niger Republic. Although he did not go into details, he said the restriction was carried out through the Central Bank of Nigeria. He stated, and I quote, I can also report that the following that following the expiration of the deadline of the ultimatum and standing on the pre-existing consensus position of financial sanctions meted out on the military junta in Niger Republic by the bloc of ECOWAS heads of state, President Bola Tinibu has ordered an additional spree of financial sanctions through the Central Bank of Nigeria on entities and individuals related to or involved with the military junta in Niger Republic. Still ahead on the news, federal government pleads with resident doctors to end strike. 
On Tuesday, the federal government bet the striking members of the Nigerian Association of Resident Doctors NARD to halt their planned nationwide protest and end the ongoing strike for the sake of Nigerians because thousands of people were dying in numbers in the hospitals across the country. Dachun Kalom, Kachalom brother, the permanent secretary, Federal Ministry of Labor and Employment, made this appeal in Abuja at the ministry's headquarters. Daju, who has been conciliating on behalf of the government with the unions, pleaded with the NARC members not to let more Nigerians to die due to the absence in the hospitals. She pleaded with the striking doctors to return to work without further delay to save their fellow countrymen whose lives are hanging between life and death, assuring that the government is working tirelessly to meet all the demands of NARD in a short period of time. The permanent secretary explained that the major issues of which NARD had insisted quick response were the Medical Residency Training Fund, um, MRTF, and the one-on-one -on -one replacement of doctors in hospitals. She also said that while the committee set up to look into the issues raised by NARD needs to conclude their work within the time frame given and submit recommendations for government to work with, government had appealed to the striking doctors to exercise legal patients for ministers to come on board. On the planned picketing of health ministries and agencies nationwide, the permanent secretary said, and I quote, government is committed without a doubt to considering the expectations of all parties concerned in the interest of industrial harmony and peace. That is what we need. And finally, on the news, Nigerians to pay more tax, according to federal government. President Bola Ahmed Tinubu while inaugurating the Presidential Committee on Fiscal Policy and Tax Reforms, PCFPTR in Abuja, charged the committee to improve the country's revenue profile and business environment. A major aim set by the federal government is to achieve an 18% tax to GDP ratio within three years. To accomplish this goal, the committee has been given a one-year mandate which is divided into three major focus areas, fiscal governance, tax reforms and growth facilitation. He directed all government ministries and departments to cooperate fully with the committee towards achieving its mandate. Tinibu said the committee has the responsibility of assisting the administration in meeting the high expectations of citizens to make their lives even better. Acknowledging Nigeria's present international standing in the tax sector, the president said the nation was still facing challenges in areas such as ease of tax payment and its tax to GDP ratio. The birth of the committee is in tandem with President Tinibu's commitment to removing obstacles that hinder business growth in Nigeria. The committee constituted on July 7th is led by Taiwo Oyedele, a seasoned expert in fiscal policy and taxation from PricewaterhouseCoopers PwC. The committee comprises individuals from both the private and public sectors who possess expertise in various domains, including tax law reform, fiscal policy design and coordination, tax harmonization and revenue administration. Mr. Oyedele promised total commitment of members to give their best in the interest of the nation. A recap of major stories says India's opposition targets Modi in their no confidence motion. Ukraine to receive dozens of second-hand Leopard 1 tanks. Irish police mistakenly share officers' vital information. Moscow intercepts two armed drones and eight Amazon countries launch summit in Brazil. That's all on the news. Thanks for watching.